obsessed, curious, distracted, and fixated. Like an accident on the side of the road, we can't look away. Something or someone has our attention. We are followers. We are all following something. Sports teams, political candidates, natural disasters, breaking news, financial markets, technology trends, famous people. The list never ends. What is your curious obsession? Who or what are you following? Is Jesus on your list? Does he turn in and out of your thoughts? Is he a consideration of who you are and what you do? He should be. Let your heart catch fire with what it means to be a Jesus father. Your life will never be the same. It is uh, good to be with you guys today. Really quick, a couple really quick announcements before we jump into God's Word. First and foremost, if this is your first time here with us, we're honored that you chose to be our guest today. If you could do us a favor after the service, there's a, an area right there that says new here. We'd love to give you a free gift and answer any questions you may have, but we are just truly honored that you chose to spend what is our first Sunday of the year together. Obviously, it's not the first Sunday, but it's our first Sunday together. And one other announcement, uh, there's a brand new men's Bible study that's going to be starting this Thursday night here at this campus. It'll be a group that meets every other Thursday night at 7 p.m. And so if you're a man that's looking to maybe grow in your faith and surround yourself with other men who are going to encourage you and challenge you to be the man that God has called you to be, I wanted to let you know about that group that's starting. Uh, like I said, every other Thursday starting this Thursday. If you want more information about that, there's a, uh, a sign-up sheet out at the Next Steps area, or you can just show up. You don't have to sign up. You could just show up on, on Thursday night. But we would love to help you continue to grow in your faith and have that available for you. Uh, it is really good to, to begin the, the new year with you guys here. Uh, hopefully you guys had a, a great end of your 2022, a great beginning of 2023. We had a, a great Saturday night with our church family on New Year's Eve. Uh, for those of you who were there, we had uh, probably around 300 or so people from both of the campuses. There was a ton of food, uh, like more food than we could ever eat. There was so much leftover food up there, cookies and all kinds of goodies. And we had a, a fun time together playing games, minute to win it games with the kids and, um, and just worshiping together, hearing a, a message to start the new year. And probably my favorite part of the night was we were able to celebrate with, I believe, eight people who were water baptized and so let's celebrate that for a moment that is um that is awesome those are are always some of our our favorite times getting to celebrate with people as they take that next step and uh, if you missed out on being there you missed out on a great night and maybe we'll do it again next year and you'll be able to to join us then but uh, it is good to be together for our first official Sunday of the year. If you've been here at Morningstar for any period of time at the beginning of a year, uh, every single year we have what we call our theme for the year that we kind of talk about in the month of January. So last year our theme theme was Live Loud. Uh, and we talked about what does it mean to not just be hearers of the Word of God, but doers of the Word of God. Our theme for 2023 is Speak Jesus. And so we're going to talk about, kind of set the table for what we're going to be talking about over the next month today, and then over the next few weeks we'll kind of break it down and talk in a, a little bit more detail about different areas of what it looks like to speak Jesus and to live this out. And the big question I want us to answer today is, what does it even mean to speak Jesus? Like when we, when we say this theme, when we talk about this theme, what are we actually talking about? Are, are we simply talking about, you know, talking about Jesus more often? Like, hey, we got to sprinkle a little bit of Jesus into our conversations, right? Like give some people some Jesus jukes. You ever hear that? Where they're in the middle of a conversation and you just completely take the conversation to Jesus and they're like, where'd that come from? Like are we, are we talking about like just talking about Jesus in our lives? And let me tell you, I think talking about Jesus more often, speaking Jesus in that way is a good thing. It's not a bad thing to want to talk about Jesus. But when we talk about speak Jesus, when we talk about this theme, it's so much more than just talking about Jesus. I, I want us to think about our entire lives for a moment. When we think about our lives, not just our words, but the way that we live our lives. What message is your life speaking? What's the message that your life is speaking? When people see you, when they think about who you are, when they think about uh, the way that you live your life, when they think about what's most important to you, your priorities and convictions, what is the message that your life 
is speaking. Because every single one of us, we have to realize that our lives are speaking a message. Our, our lives are, are constantly through our actions and, and what we value and what's most important to us. We're speaking a message. And we can say all of the right words. We can be people who talk about Jesus all the time. But if our life doesn't match up, if our life doesn't line up, if our life doesn't speak Jesus, then our words really don't matter that much. And so when we talk about this idea of speak Jesus, our hope and prayer is that this year, more than ever before, our desire is that we would be a church that's full of people who speak and declare the goodness and the nature of Jesus to a world that desperately needs to know who Jesus is. That we would declare his goodness and that we would constantly point people to him. And here's why this is so important. Jesus is central to everything. I know it's like an obvious statement. We're in church, so obviously it should be Jesus is, you know, you're, you're talking to the, you're preaching to the choir here, right? But the truth is, it's so easy to, to kind of try to add things and, and, make things about, and make it about other things other than Jesus. That's why for us as a church, when we, when we thought about our core values, who we wanted to be, we, we said our first core value was that we're going to be all about Jesus. And we constantly strive to make that true. Because anytime we lose sight of that, anytime we make this about anything other than Jesus, we miss out. It's not Jesus plus all these other things. In fact, if we try to add anything to Jesus, with Jesus plus anything else, it's actually nothing. Whether it's Jesus plus a job, Jesus plus family, Jesus plus you know, the, saying the right things, Jesus plus having the right actions, Jesus plus the right political affiliation. Anything that we try to add to Jesus, when we add something to Jesus, we actually lose everything. And if at any point what we do here stops being about just Jesus, becomes about anything else other than Jesus, then what we do here becomes pointless. Because the truth is this, you could take away the fancy building, you could take away the free coffee. Some of you probably wouldn't come, but you could take away the free coffee. We could take away all of these other things. We could take away the sound system, which is popping all the time anyway, right? We can take away the worship team. You could take away the pastors and everything else. If we have Jesus, though, we have everything we need. We have everything we need as long as we keep it about Jesus. And here's the thing. It's not like a new temptation to try to make it about things other than Jesus. Throughout history, Christians and churches have, have struggled with keeping the main thing the main thing. They've struggled with, with keeping Jesus central to everything they do. In fact, most of the letters that Paul writes in the New Testament, if you think about it, most of those letters are written to Christians and churches who were struggling with trying to add other things to Jesus. And Paul writes to these different churches to point out areas where they have wrong theology or areas where they have allowed false teachers to kind of make their way into the churches and, and things that they're teaching that are, that are actually hurting the message of Christ, that are keeping them from being who they're called to be. And the reason that this is such a big deal for us and the reason that we, we make this such a priority and the reason that we want this to be the first, foremost, most important core value that we strive to be here at a church is this. Anytime we allow ourselves to drift away from the true gospel, the true purpose of, of what we do here, Jesus being the center of all of it, our lives will begin to speak a message different than what we're called to speak. Meaning we can't speak Jesus with our lives if everything in our lives is not about Jesus, if it's not built on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this morning what I want to do as we, as we kind of kick off this series is I want to look at a portion, a, a couple portions of scripture from the book of Colossians. Uh, the book of Colossians is really a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in the city of Colossae. And this was a church that was most likely a church plant uh, off of the, the ministry that had been done in the city of Ephesus. And, and this was a church that was doing really well. They were growing. God was moving. There was people getting saved. They were growing in their faith. But what was happening at the same time is there was some, some false teachers that had kind of made their way into the church. And, and what they were doing is they were trying to add to the gospel. They were trying to, to add. It wasn't just about Jesus. It wasn't just Jesus at the center of it all. It was Jesus plus these other things. You needed Jesus plus. And, and so Paul writes to confront some of those areas of compromise to deal with those areas. They would talk about, well, it's not just Jesus, it's Jesus plus, you know, you're, you're religious. There was Jewish people who would say, well, you still need to follow all the law perfectly. It's Jesus plus your ability to follow the law perfectly that makes you right. And there was other people who would say, it's Jesus plus making sure you follow certain religious ceremonies and you honor certain holy days. That's what makes you right with God. And then there was other people who were teaching, well, it's Jesus plus like mysticism and you need to have these certain spiritual experiences. And if you have those certain spiritual experiences, then you have what you need. It's not just Jesus, it's Jesus plus those things. 
And there was other people teaching that it was Jesus plus these other pagan gods, right? You, you can follow Jesus, but you can also worship these other gods, and you can mix these other religions in place, and it's not just Jesus. And so Paul is writing to get back to the heart of the gospel. It's not Jesus plus all these other things. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's just Jesus. Jesus is central to all of it. And I want to look at some verses in chapter 1 as we begin uh, because I think these verses, these are kind of like the, the main portion where he just kind of kind of fights against all of those different things that they were trying to teach that were taking away from Jesus being the center of it all. And as we read these verses, I want you to just think about the magnitude of what he is saying in these verses, about who Jesus is, the importance of keeping Jesus the main thing, the center of all that we do. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who will rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. So what is Paul doing in these verses? Paul in these verses is trying to bring everybody back to the centrality of Jesus. He's trying to remind us of the importance of Jesus in all this. That we can never drift away from Jesus being the center of everything. No matter how much temptation there is to kind of add things to Jesus and to try to add things to the gospel. We need to continually remind ourselves and come back to this place where it's just about Jesus. He talks really about four things in those verses. The first thing he talks about is that Jesus reveals God. He says Jesus is the, the visible image of the invisible God. In other words, Jesus makes the invisible God visible and known. Jesus is what shows us who God is, his nature, helps us understand. If you ever wonder, what is God like? I don't understand God. I don't know God. You can read the scriptures, you can read the New Testament, you can read the Gospels, you can read and see how Jesus interacted with people, how Jesus loved people, how Jesus treated people, and you see the heart and the nature of God. Why? Because he is the radiance of God's glory, and he makes the invisible God visible and knowable. Number two, Jesus is the creator and sustainer of everything. It says he existed before anything was created, and is supreme over all creation. Everything it said it was created through him and what? And for him. Everything is created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Look, this is a reminder for us, right? Because sometimes, how many of you ever like, you look at the news, you look at what's going on in the world, you look at what's going on politically, and you feel like everything's falling apart. Anybody? And you get like, for like everything's falling apart, the world is falling apart. Can I tell you, nothing is falling apart unless God allows it to fall apart. Because he is in control of everything. He says he is the creator and the sustainer. And nothing is going to go outside of his plan. Everything he understands and sees. And some of us, we need to remind ourselves of that because we get so worried when we see all the craziness in the world. Let me just tell you, spoiler alert, read the Bible. If you read the Bible, you know. If you're on Team Jesus, you win. You can sleep well at night. Like you don't have to live in fear and worry. And sometimes we just have to remind ourselves that Jesus is in control. That he is the creator and the sustainer. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light 
of men. The third thing Paul talks about is not only is he the creator and sustainer of the world, that he is also the head of his church. He's the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who will rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. The church is made to function under the lordship, the leadership, the headship of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 4, it says it like this. It says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. That is our goal as followers of Christ. This should be our, our life's goal. More than anything else, our job, our goal should be that we continue to grow more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit perfectly together. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Let me just tell you this. A church that is not all about Jesus is a, a headless church. And I don't know if you know this about a body, but the head's pretty important. Like, you'll die. You don't have your head, it's a recipe for death. And a church that doesn't continue to have Jesus as the head. And you'll notice this, we see it all throughout. There's many churches who have got away from it being all about Jesus and have made it about all other things. And what is happening in those churches is that they are slowly dying because they have removed Jesus as the head of their, their church. And it's the only p position he can be in. He is the head of what we do here. He is the leader of everything we do here. It is all about him. We can remove everything else. And as long as we have him, we have everything we need. And then the last thing we see in those verses is that Jesus reconciles all things to God. What it says in those verses is that you and I were separated from God. There was nothing that you and I could do about that standing. We couldn't change it. But Jesus made a way for us to be reconciled to God. And he's the only way for us to be reconciled. He says in those verses, you and I were his enemies, separated from him by our evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. In Romans chapter 8, it says it like this. It says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Jesus is central to everything. Jesus is the sustainer and creator of all things. He is the one who reveals the nature, the heart, the love of God to us. He is the one who is the head of his church, and he is the only one who is able to make us right with God. We need to continually come back to the heart of the gospel. We need to continually remind ourselves that it's all about Jesus. In Colossians 2, Paul goes on to say this in verses 6 through 7. He says, and now just as you've accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong and the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. What he's reminding us in these verses is that we don't need anything more than the gospel. Sometimes you're, you grow up in church, you're in church the whole time. I just need to go deeper. I need something deeper. The truth is we never get deeper than the gospel. We just continually grow our roots down deep into the gospel. He says, grow your roots. Like put your, your found, build your foundation. Grow deep down into the love of God. Build your foundation on, on God. Just continue to follow him. Continue to grow. Continue to understand him more. Build your life on that foundation. It's all about Jesus. And the reason this is so important is because we cannot speak Jesus unless our lives are all about Jesus. The message that our lives will speak won't be what it's meant to be, what we're called to speak, if we don't continue to have our lives be just about Jesus. But how do we live this out practically? Right, like, I like, I like practical. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You like practical. Like, I, I like instructions. I like some step-by-step -step instructions. What does it look like to live this out? And so, as we begin to close this morning, I joke with the first service, uh, doesn't mean I'm actually closing, just in case you were wondering. Uh, some of them were like, we're closing already? Man, the new year, new pastor. He's really short-winded. That's not true, sorry. Uh, that wasn't my New Year's resolution. Some of your New Year's resolution was that I'd be shorter. Well, keep praying. Um, but I want to look at some verses, another portion of Scripture in Colossians, because I think this portion of Scripture really gets practical. It gives us some really practical instructions, what it looks like to live this out. These are things we've talked about before, but I think are just really, really good reminders as we begin a new year and as we 
talk about what it means to actually live this out. So let's look at Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 17. It says this. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death these sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. And you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. Instead, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. And since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace. And always be thankful. And let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of our Lord Jesus. Giving thanks through him to God the Father. As we close this morning, three practical action steps I think we can see from these verses. If you take a notice, the first one that he talks about, if we're going to speak Jesus with our lives, is we need to, we need to change our thinking. We need to change our thinking. If we're going to live lives that speak Jesus, it begins up here. It begins with our thoughts. And I think most of us would understand and agree that the way we think is important. In many things in life, the, the, the way that you think about life, uh, like so, as you think, so you are. Like the way you think is really, really important. And we're, we're reminded of that in those first four verses, that the way we think is really important. Uh, he says, since you are a new creation in Christ. I want, I want you to understand, if you are a follower of Christ, if you've given your heart to him, you've surrendered your life to him, you've put your faith and your trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross in your place for your sins, if that is you, then the reality of your life according to God's word is that you are a new creation. doesn't mean you always feel like a new creation. Come on, how many of you ever read days and be like, I don't feel that new. I, don't, I, I kind of have some anger issues still. I'm still struggling with some areas of my life. Doesn't mean we always feel that way, but the reality of our lives, the, the, the identity that the Bible says we have, if we are in Christ, is we are a new creation. And so what he says is, since you are a new creation, this is your reality, this is your identity. If you are a new creation, then you need to change the way you think. You need to think a new way. What does he tell us? He tells us in these verses to set your minds on the things of heaven. Focus not on the things of this earth, but on the realities of heaven. Think about the things of heaven. Not the things of earth. And, and what I think is, this is a really, really good way for us to take a little bit of inventory in our lives to see if our lives are truly speaking Jesus. We can just kind of think about our thought life. We start there. We begin to do a little bit of an inventory on, on the things that we think about, what consumes our minds and our thoughts. Ask yourself that for, for a moment. What occupies the greatest time in your mind? What occupies your thoughts in, in your mind? Is it earthly or eternal? If you're constantly focused on the things of this world, if you're constantly filled with worry and anxiety, if you're constantly living in fear as you look at the direction of the world, if you're constantly thinking about chasing after earthly things, earthly pleasure, if that is the things that consume your, your mind, the thoughts, or, or is it eternal things? 
Is your mindset focused on the things of the Lord? God, how can I live my life for your glory? How can I live my life for your purpose? How can I point other people to you? God, how can I look at this problem that I'm dealing with through your perspective? God, how can I, how, how can I look at the problems I'm dealing with with your mindset? How can I take that thought captive and make it obedient to the truth of God's word? All of these things we have to do. You want to change your life? You want your life to speak Jesus? Then begin by allowing him to change your thoughts. So it says in the Bible, it says that you're a new creation. As a new creation, you need to think a new way. You need to allow God to transform you into that new creation by changing the way you think. We can't speak Jesus if our thoughts are not the right way, if we're not thinking the right way, if our mindset's not focused on the right thing. And so just do a little quick inventory on your life. And do a little bit of a quick inventory on what consumes your thoughts. And ask yourself, is this earthly or eternal? The second thing he talks about, the second action step we're encouraged to take in these verses is not only to change our thinking, but then we need to make the choice to kill the flesh. In verse 5, he begins to instruct us on some things that we need to put to death, he says, in our lives. And this is really, really important because our lives can't speak Jesus if our lives look the exact same way they did before we knew Jesus. Like, we have to live different. As followers of Christ, we're called to live different. You're a new creation, which means you don't have to live the same way you used to live before you knew Jesus. Some of you, you got some things in your past, right? Like, we like to hide those things. We don't like to talk about those things. But that's who you used to be. That's not who you are anymore. In Christ, you're, you're new. And so what is those areas in your life that, that the Lord would say you need to put to death? And, and Paul begins to talk about some of these things. He says, put to death those things that are earthly Inside of you, those things like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry, uncontrolled anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. And can I tell you, this isn't a complete list. This isn't, there's other things the Bible would talk about that are, are sinful in our, our lives. And what it's saying is that these are all things that we need to deal with. These are all things that we need to, that we need to work on killing in, that are inside of us that are part of who we were before we knew Christ. I don't know if you understand this or realize this, but you're not a finished product. Like you're a work in progress. Any of you, you gave your life to Christ and you woke up the next morning, you were like, man, I don't have any struggles anymore. I don't have any, there's no temptation. I don't have any sins. I'm not angry at all anymore. I don't struggle with, with lustful thoughts anymore. I don't have any of those things. I'm perfect now. This is awesome. Anybody? Not, none of us. There ain't nobody that stands up on this platform. There's nobody that's here. We're all in the same boat. We're all works in progress. None of us has arrived. We all have areas in our lives that God is continually trying to work. When we talk about salvation, right, we often use these, these three kind of words to kind of explain salvation. We use the word justification, sanctification, and glorification. And so when we talk about the word justification, that's a legal word. That's a legal standing word. It's a word that, that, that when we talk about salvation, we're talking about justification is that you are saved. At the moment that you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, your legal standing, your spiritual legal standing with God has been changed. You went from outsider to insider. You went from death to life. You went from a slave to your sin to a slave to righteousness, a son of God or daughter of God. There's a, a change in your identity the moment that you put your faith and your trust in Jesus. It's like when you stand before God at that moment, you stand before God and, and you're, declared, you're declared not guilty. Not based on anything you've done to make yourself not guilty, but based on the fact that Jesus paid your penalty for you. The other word, just that word sanctification is, is almost like we are, are being saved. It's that process that God has in our lives where we are continually being made more like Jesus. And it is a lifelong process. You're not going to wake up one morning and be like, you know what? I've arrived. It's like Jesus and I'm a close second. You're not. You're not going to wake up. It's going to be a lifelong process. And sometimes it's going to be really, really obvious. There's a whole list of things that are often really, really obvious in our lives. You know what? He says I shouldn't be angry. And I'm angry all the time, especially when I get in the car and some slow person drives in front of me. Maybe that's lack of patience too. I'm, I'm two sins in one right there. Right, I still deal with these things. Like These are certain things in here that are obvious in our lives. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, all of these things. And so sometimes it's a very obvious thing in our life that he says you need to deal with this. This is not who you are anymore. This may be who you were before, but you're a new creation. And this is not what you need to continue to walk in. You don't have to be a slave to that sin anymore. You need to deal with that sin. And we choose to, to surrender those areas to God and we choose to walk in righteousness. Sometimes it's a lot less obvious. 
Sometimes it's not just this big, huge, sinful thing. It's, it's something that's more hidden, like a wrong motive in our lives or, 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 or pride or self-righteousness or whatever else it could look like. And it's a lifelong process that God is walking with us and he is working inside of us and he is revealing things that need to be changed and he is working to help us change those things. It's a process. But the good news is, is that if you're a follower of Christ and you are a new creation in Christ, you never again have to be a slave to any sin. You never again have to walk as a slave to any sin. Doesn't mean you won't sin, doesn't mean you won't mess up, but you never have to continue to walk in any kind of bondage to sin in your life. You have freedom in Christ. Galatians chapter 2.20 says it like this. It says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love this verse because it reminds us that when we are in Christ, we are not the same person we used to be. And because we're not the same person, we don't have to continue to allow that sin that once held us in bondage, that sin that once defined our life, we don't ever have to allow that sin to define our lives again. It says Christ is living in us, which means his power, his power is available to us. The Bible says that we have everything we need to live a life that honors him. You lack nothing. You lack nothing that you need to live for Christ, to fight against sin and to live for his glory. And if we're going to speak Jesus with our lives, then we need to do battle with those areas of sin that God reveals to us so that our lives are, aren't about those sins, but that our lives will shine brightly who Jesus is and what he's called us to be. And the last action step we're encouraged to take in these verses is where you're called to put on the new us, the new you. Verse 10 says it again. It says, put on your new nature. And be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Just like there's things that we need to, to take off, so to speak. Kind of like taking off old dirty clothes. Right? You, you're, you, go, you go for a run. You're, you're sweaty and smelly and gross. Like you got to take that off. Right? Like nobody wants to be around you when you smell like that. Some of those old things about our nature, those are things that we take off. We, we remove those old dirty clothes, that old nature. But then he says there's things that we need to put on. We need to replace things that are the new us. And even though we're new creations in Christ, that's our identity, we still have a responsibility that we need to walk this out every day. Like we need to continue every single day to die to ourselves, to die to our flesh, and to be new in Christ, to walk in this newness that he has given us. And so he talks in these verses about things that we're called to put on. Characteristics like clothing ourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, Patience, forgiving one another because we have been forgiven. Clothing yourselves with love. Letting the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Always being thankful. Just think for a moment in your own life. Practically speaking, what, what your life would look like, what our lives would look like is if we just begin to walk in these three things. If we just began to, to allow God to continue to work on the way we think. And we continue to allow ourselves to be transformed and renewed by spending time in God's word. By building our, our minds on the foundation of Christ. By practically speaking, doing what the Bible says. Taking our thoughts captive and making them obedient to the truth of God's word. Like what would our lives look like if we started there and we began to allow God to change the way we think. And there's a responsibility on our part because when we have thoughts that do not line up with the truth of God's word. We have a choice in those moments whether we're going to continue to think about those thoughts. Or whether we're going to take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to the truth of who God says we are. So we're going to take our thoughts captive, we're going to change our thinking, and we're going to choose not to settle into the sin that we've allowed in our lives, but we're going to choose to understand who we are as new creations, which means we're going to continue to do work with anything that God shows us, whether it's a big sin that is glaring in our lives, or whether it's one of those kind of hidden sins that we've just kind of allowed to fester. And we deal with those things. What would it look like if we begin to actually go to war with those things and put those things to death because we want our lives not to shine brightest our sin, but to shine brightest who Jesus is? And not only that, we began to actually do the things he's called us to do. To put on, what would it look like, seriously? If we had a church full of people who walked in humility, and gentleness, compassion, patience, love, forgiveness. Come on, like that, that's not easy, is it? You don't know what's been done to me, you don't know what's happened in my life, and so that's my right to hold on to this. But no, we've been forgiven, and so we choose to forgive, even when it's hard. It, it, it makes us set apart. Our lives look different because we're putting on the very nature 
of God. We're clothing ourselves with who he is and who he says to be. The good news is, verse 16, it tells us how this is all possible. It tells us how we can actually begin to walk this out. It says, let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. That right there is the key. That, that we continue to allow the, the, the message of Christ, the richness of Christ, who he is, the centrality of Jesus to all this. We continue to allow that to fill our lives. Because what we fill our lives with is what flows out of us. You understand that? Like if you have kids, right? We, have you ever told your kids, man, garbage in, garbage out? Meaning like if we just fill ourselves with nonsense all the time, if all you ever do is watch the news. How many of you feel yourself being a little bit more depressed when you look at the world? If all you do is go on social media all the time, you, what do you feel? Man, my life is terrible compared to everybody else's. They went on this cool vacation. I got nowhere, right? You get overwhelmed. If you just fill yourself with garbage all the time, garbage is what flows out of your life. I tell my kids all the time, like, if, I, if I let them, what, the, what would your kids do? They play on their tablets for the whole day, right? They don't take a break at all. And if all they do is fill themselves with garbage, that's what's going to flow out of their life. That's what flows out of our life. But the, the opposite of that is true as well. When we fill ourselves with God's word, when we fill ourselves with goodness, when we fill ourselves with righteousness, that is what flows out of our life as well. So he says, fill your lives with Christ. Continue to build your lives on the foundation of Christ. And that's what's going to flow out of you. As we close today, would you stand with me? We're going to close with communion and worship. And uh, if you didn't receive communion, that was that cup you were handed when you came in. Some of you were like, I never took communion this way before. Uh, this is the way we started taking communion with COVID. It's just easier. The bread's kind of on that top layer. It might take you 47 minutes to get it open, so you might want to start. Some of you are like, I hate these things. We don't like them either. Um, and so if you want to get it open, you can get it open. If you didn't receive it when you came in and you want to take communion, just raise your hand and some of our greeting team will, will pass that around for you. But when we take communion, these are always good opportunities. The Bible says to examine our, our hearts and our lives. In fact, the Bible says that we need to examine our lives so we don't take communion in a way that dishonors God in an unholy way, an unrighteous way. And so these are always good opportunities for us to examine our lives to see if we are who we say we are, that we are in the faith. And what I want us to do as we prepare to take this today is I want us to specifically get back to what we asked in the very beginning, which was what message is, is your life speaking? I want you to just, maybe just close your eyes for a moment. We're going to do a little bit of inventory in our lives. I want you to just ask yourself, is your life speaking, Jesus? If people were to ask, were to talk about you and say, this is what I know about this person, this is what their life is all about, would it be Jesus? Is Jesus central to your entire life? If you're a follower of Jesus, whether you're kind of new to all of this, maybe like a, a baby Christian, or you've been following Jesus for a really long time, I want us to, to make it our prayer and our desire that we would strive to speak Jesus with our lives this year. That we would speak Jesus in our homes, in our workplaces we speak Jesus, in our schools we speak Jesus. Everywhere we go, and everything we say, we choose to speak Jesus. It's what it says in verse 17, the very last verse we, say, we, we read, it says, In whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. Now when you are in Christ, and this is a whole different sermon for a whole different day, but oftentimes we talk about the Ten Commandments and we talk about do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And we've watered that down to be just a word that we don't say. And I, I think that commandment is so much deeper and so much more than what we've made it to be. That when, when, the, when it says, do not take the name of your Lord God in vain, it's, it's do not take the name of God, do not take the name of Christ lightly. I mean, we're not called to be just to carry Christianity around as a title. I'm a Christian. And live our lives like he has never made. Many of us, we live our lives, if we're honest, as practical atheists. We're not atheists, but we live our lives with the name of Christ as our title. But we live our lives like he doesn't exist in our actions. And so it's important for us at times to, to examine our lives and to say, okay, am I actually living what I say I, I live? Do I actually believe what I say I believe? Do I actually live this out? Not am I perfect, 
Because we've already established none of us is there. But is my life speaking, Jesus? Do, do I, is the loudest message that my life is declaring that Jesus is my Savior? That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That Jesus, it's all about Jesus. It's not about my good works. It's not about anything else that I've elevated. It's simply about just Jesus. As we take just a few moments to, to worship together, we're going to just reflect on that before we take communion. So Father, today we thank you so much for this time in your word. Pray that even in these next few moments, God, you would reveal things in our lives maybe that are not what they should be, God. And God, I pray that we would have the courage to surrender those areas to you, that we would have the courage as we think about and take communion. And Lord, we would have the courage to, to trust you with every area. That we would not be people who just claim the name of Jesus. But God, we would be people who declare boldly, shout boldly the name of Jesus. Not with just our, just our words, but with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.